Okay, guys, hello. We're back today, and we're going to talk about Skinner, uh, specifically his work called Science and Human Behavior. So here's some quick background information, if you guys don't already know this. Uh, Skinner was a 20th century American psychologist. Some of you may have already heard of him if you took an intro to psych class or any other psych class. Um, and you might be wondering, why are we studying a psychologist, right? Like, isn't this a philosophy class? And that's a good thing to be wondering. And the answer is that there's some overlap. Um, there's some overlap insofar as both study the quote-unquote mind, uh, but there's also overlap insofar as any of the sciences and any of the other disciplines really, in general, um, utilize certain philosophical presuppositions, and it's kind of the job of the philosopher to understand those presuppositions. So you can understand the philosopher as being like the, the meta-disciplinary, right? The one that really try to understand the underlying uh, foundational principles within different disciplines, and psychology is one of them. And within psychology, Skinner was a proponent of this thing called behaviorism. Obviously, this has something to do with how things behave. We'll get to that throughout the lesson. So here's some opening questions that I want you guys to think about. Number one, you are a certain way, right? You have certain likes, you have certain dislikes, you think a certain way, you feel certain things. You want to ask, why is that? Why are you the way that you are? There, you may have a bunch of different answers lined up or, or proto answers. Maybe you think it has something to do with uh, my choice, right? Something about I became this way because of how I wanted to act. Maybe you think it has something to do with your history. But these are just things you want to start to think about. And similarly, why do you do the things that you do? Like right now, you're listening to this lecture, hopefully. Why are you doing that? Why aren't you watching TV? Why aren't you making art? Why are you enrolled at Middlesex County College? Why aren't you at Brookdale? Why aren't you at a different university? Why aren't you a mechanic, right? You want to start to think about why it is that you do the things that you do and why it is that you are at a certain point in your life. And these are going to kind of help you frame the discussion. Now, the answer to these questions probably involved something having to do with free will. And free will is going to wind up being the main thing we talk about for today. Um, you can understand this in a couple of ways. One way to understand free will is to say that if free will exists, this means that we have some kind of choice, right? Like in other words, we're presented with a set of options and we could choose any of those options, right? There's no reason why it has to be one or why it has to be another one. We have options. And similarly, once things happen, you believe that things could have happened otherwise. So for example, I am recording this lecture at 3.05 p.m. And I believe that's because I chose it. And I believe, well, I didn't have to do it at 3.05. Uh, it could have happened at another time. Or maybe I could have recorded a different lecture before this. Or maybe I could have been doing something else. Right? Most of us tend to believe that we have some freedom to make choices uh, and that once we make our choices, we just happen to make those choices, but we could have made other choices. And if we believe in free will, this means that we believe the future isn't written yet, right? Like you're kind of in control of your own life. What I always say is that you're the master of your own destiny. So it's not determined. That's a word we'll be talking about for today. Uh, it's not yet determined uh, what you will become. Right? You're not determined to become a doctor or to not escape your situation or to escape your situation, anything. Right? So the idea is if free will is real, we have some kind of choice about what happens in the future. 
Um, and once things happen, they don't necessarily happen that way for any reason other than that we've chosen them. So here's a question, right? We talked about before, why are you the way that you are? If we were to reformulate this in new terms now that we've brought free will into the mix, we want to ask, do humans have free will? That's really what we're asking, right? When we say, why are you the way that you are? And why do you do things in the way that you do them? Uh, we're asking, is it you? Do you make those choices? Are you the way that you are because you consciously decided to be that way? Are you doing the things you're doing and not doing the things you're not doing because you made that decision? Because you have this will and you're free to make choices? Maybe. And this is the topic that Skinner is going to talk about. And as it turns out, Skinner is going to be a little, little bit of a critic of this thing. So let's check it out. On page 23 of Science and Human Behavior, Skinner says, We are concerned then with the causes of human behavior. We want to know why men behave as they do. Any condition or event which can be shown to have an effect upon behavior must be taken into account. By discovering and analyzes, uh, analyzing these causes, rather, we can predict behavior. And to the extent that we can manipulate them, we can control behavior. Such a pretty heavy passage. Uh, the first thing you want to note is Skinner is concerned with this question about free will. Right? Why are people the way they do? Why do they act the way they do? And he says any condition which has an effect upon behavior is something that must be analyzed because these are the causes, right? Any kind of condition uh, of your body, of the world, uh, of anything, or any kind of thing that happens has to be studied as a possible cause uh, of why you are the way that you are and why you do what you do. And this allows us to predict behavior, right? Because we can use past occurrences to make predictions about future occurrences because we believe that nature is regular and patterns exist and that all of us follow a kind of pattern. And if that pattern is strong enough, we can actually control behavior, right? We can do things to ensure that people are gonna do certain things and not do certain things, right? So it's all about behavior, what causes it and what we can do to determine certain outcomes. So he says at the bottom of 23 going into 24, there is a curious inconsistency in the zeal with which the doctrine of personal freedom has been defended because men have always been fascinated by the search for causes. So strong is the urge to explain human behavior that men have been led to anticipate legitimate scientific inquiry and to construct highly implausible theories of causation. This practice is not unusual in the history of science. The study of any subject begins in the realm of superstition. The fanciful explanation precedes the valid. Astronomy began as astrology and chemistry as alchemy. So when Skinner uses this phrase, doctrine of personal freedom, he's talking about free will. So most people fall upon free will as the answer to those questions we asked earlier. Right, so why am I the way that I am? Why do I do what I do? Well, because I have free will. I have this real that this will that has a certain element of freedom to do what it wants. But Skinner says, mm, I don't know. There's kind of an inconsistency with how people defend this idea. And at the end of the day, it's not real. It's just that we really want something to be real. That that's going to be the theme here today. That. We have a really strong desire to explain things and we want to preserve our pre-existing beliefs. I mean, this is something that philosophy in general tries to shake, right? But Skinner himself is going to try and shake it in his own way. Um, we want to believe certain things so strongly that we create like crazy theories of causation just to preserve our pre-existing beliefs. In other words he's going to show us that the evidence for the existence of something like free will is not strong. There's actually no real evidence for it. 
It's just that we come up with these crazy ideas sometimes because we want to believe. And actually, the belief in free will is like superstition. It's like, you know, don't walk under a ladder or else you'll get bad luck. Um, don't break a mirror or else you'll get seven years of bad luck. It's just don't step on a, a crack. You'll break your mother's back, right? Like these silly things. Um, it seems like we're willing to admit that those things are silly, but he wants to throw free will into that set. And free will is actually like belief in astrology and alchemy. Uh, so sorry to the people who believe in astrology, but Skinner is, is not a big fan of this. And if you don't know what alchemy is, this is like these earlier versions of chemistry where we're like, oh, I'm mixing wind and air, and then I have fire, just things like that. Um, and free will is just like these pseudoscience, as we could say. That's a good word to know. And then he continues. Any conspicuous event which coincides with human behavior is likely to be seized upon as a cause. The position of the planets at birth of the individual is an example, and that's astrology, right? Numerology finds a different set of causes. For example, in the numbers which compose the street address of the individual or in the letters of his name, millions of people turn to these spurious causes every year in their desperate need to understand human behavior and to deal with it effectively. So the idea is we see something happen, and then when we see something happen, we recognize that something happened right before it, and or we notice that something happens right after it. Right. So we look at an event, and we look at the events surrounding that event, and we, we latch on to some kind of explanation. We say like, ah, these events happened together. So there must be a relation between those two events. Oh, he did this on this day at this time. So there must be some relation between that information. And that's not always the case. And astrology is one of those examples like, oh, when she was born, uh, she had Jupiter in the seventh house. So this must be why she has that personality. Or, hmm, his address is five, six, five, and if you add those and then divide it by three. So we try to find things that aren't really there, Skinner's saying, right? And we turn to these false causes just because we have a desperate need to understand things. We really, really, really want to understand things. And sometimes our desire to understand things obscures our desire for truth, right? Because sometimes will believe things that aren't true just because it completes the picture, just because it gets rid of any unsurety. It makes us feel better, right? He says it helps us deal with things. It's like a coping mechanism. But remember, um, feelings and coping mechanisms, these don't really have any place in an objective understanding of reality. These have no place in science and some would say even in philosophy. So there are two logical fallacies that Skinner uh, kind of indirectly refers to. The one that he brought up in the last passage was something called a post hoc fallacy. Um, if you've taken my logic class, you will have encountered this before. The full name is the post hoc ergo propter hoc. This is just when you assert a false cause. This is what happens when, like, let's say there are two events. There's event A, and then there's event B. And then event B happens after event A. So you say, oh, event A must have caused event B. And the most easy example of this is, um, you know, you hear the rooster crow at the farm in the morning, and then the sun rises. So you say, ah, so it must have been the rooster that caused the sun to rise. And of course, that's not true. You're just drawing a connection between things that are only incidentally connected. Or let's say you played a game with your sports team. And on that day, you won. And you happen to be wearing a specific pair of socks. So you conclude wrongfully, 
oh, it must have been the socks that made me win. These are my lucky socks. I'm going to wear these socks every time we play a game from now on. Also a false cause. Um, the example I always think of in my life is when I was little, uh, I lived in like a, a real urban area, and I was walking past, I think it was like a post office or something, and I must have been, I don't know, like five years old, four or five, and there was this button, I think it was a doorbell on the side of a building, and it was like ample children attention drawing button like it was shiny and red and had this cool texture so what did i do i pressed the button because that's what kids do and as soon as i pressed the button i had some big pain in my ear and what wound up happening is i got stung by a bee in the earlobe it was like so bad that i think i had to go to the hospital to get it removed but the bottom line is after that day can you guess what happened? I never touched the button again because I thought the button was why I got that stinger in my ear. Not true, right? That was a false cause fallacy. Um, the phrase you guys might have heard in some of your science classes is correlation does not equal causation. And that's the point, right? Just because two things occur simultaneously, just because there's a correlation just because there's some kind of hypothetical connection between two things does not mean that there's a necessary and or causal relationship between those two things. But let's go on. Skinner says, uh, the predictions of astrologers, numerologists, and the like are usually so vague that they cannot be confirmed or disproved properly. Failures are easily overlooked while an occasional chance hit is dramatic enough to maintain the behavior of the devotee in considerable strength. Okay, so when you talk to an astrologer or a numerologist or a psychic, this is the joke, right? It's like they say things that are so vague, like, hmm, does this person have any significance to you? Hmm, do they have something to do with a month? Oh, did something happen on a day? Right, like I just say really vague things that are like maybe obviously true or sometimes you can't know if they're true or not true. So they just kind of maintain this illusion uh, of authority even though it's not really there. And similarly, when people do these things, they overlook failures. They only pay attention to the things that they get right, but they ignore the things that they get wrong. And there's a word for this. This is the second logical fallacy. This is confirmation bias, right? And it's when you have this selective attention, when you only pay attention to the things that support your theory and you totally ignore the things that go against your theory. And I, I keep going back to psychics, like, I don't know, like, what's her name? Sylvia Brown or Jonathan Edwards, these people uh, were criticized for doing this. And astrologists do this, according to Skinner, numerologists do this. And as he's going to say, mm, this is what we all do whenever we believe in free will. Because free will, remember his point, it's going to wind up being nothing other than something like astrology or numerology. When we believe in free will, as we're going to see, we are not arriving at this conclusion objectively. We're just relying on feelings and confirmation bias. Let's continue. On 27, he says, Every science has at some time or other looked for causes of action inside the things it has studied. Sometimes the practice has proved useful. Sometimes it is not. There's nothing wrong with an inner explanation as such. But inner events which are located inside a system are likely to be difficult to observe. Uh, for this reason, we are encouraged to assign properties to them without justification. Worse still, we can invent causes of this sort without fear of contradiction. The motion of a rolling stone was once attributed to its vis viva. The chemical properties of bodies were thought to be derived from principles or essences of which they were composed. Combustion was explained by the phlogiston inside the combustible object. It has been especially tempting to attribute the behavior of a living organism to the behavior of an inner agent. 
as the following examples may suggest. Okay, so when something happens between things like people or objects or any kind of system, and I use that term loosely, we tend to look at the cause inside that thing, right? So we're saying something is happening within a system. Let's look within the system, within the components of the system to see why it has happened. And that's not crazy. Like a lot of the times that's a good move to do, um, which is why he says there's nothing wrong with an inner explanation as such, right? But there are a couple problems with this. Number one, uh, the inside is sometimes, maybe most of the time, difficult, if not impossible, to observe. And people are going to prove to be one of these examples where it's like, how can I actually observe your inner states? Like, I can't access your stream of consciousness. We talked about this when we did writing. It's like, you could be having all these thoughts, but there's no way for me to directly observe those things. So it doesn't seem to be of scientific value to appeal to them. Um, and But sometimes with inner causes or looking for causes within things, other than the fact that they're difficult to observe, we just kind of invent things. So it's like, mm, I can't directly observe it, so I can't really confirm or deny this, so I'm going to make up these, like, not random, but these unjustified causes that can't be confirmed or denied. And so the example is the vis viva, right? That's It's like the potential within the stone that's making it move, or the essences. And that's kind of a dig at, like, Plato, or a lot of the... Uh, ancient philosophers and medieval philosophers, I would say, Skinner is against this kind of thing for looking at forms or essences. And then phlogiston, I think I mentioned that um, when we did Descartes, phlogiston was thought to be this t this kind of stuff that just exists in things that makes it go on fire. So like if you lit a piece of wood on fire, back in the day they would say, oh, that's because the wood has phlogiston in it. And if you can't light a piece of metal on fire... It's because, oh, the metal doesn't have any phlogiston within it. Uh, but obviously, a lot of these things aren't real. And Skinner thinks free will is kind of just like these. Only when we talk about free will, we're not appealing to vis viva or phlogiston. We're appealing to an inner agent. And that's a key term I want to think about. What do you think that might mean? What might this inner agent have to do with free will and how is it similar to those pseudoscientific principles? The word agent means something like actor. So you can rephrase this question to say, what is an inner actor? And I think that makes it a little bit easier because when you talk about an inner actor with regard our freedom to think or act in certain ways, you may start to think of this idea of a self and the self is something that we've talked about fairly consistently throughout the semester and if you thought of the self when you thought of inner agent that's right and we're going to see where he goes with this he says an even more common practice is to explain behavior in terms of an inner agent which lacks physical dimensions and is called mental or psychic. The purest form of the psychic explanation is seen in the animism of primitive peoples. From the immobility of the body after death, it is inferred that a spirit responsible for movement has departed. The enthusiastic person is, as the etymology of the word suggests, energized by a god within. It is only a modest refinement to attribute every feature of the behavior of the physical organism to a corresponding feature of the mind or some inner personality. I noticed that those are in quotes. The inner man is regarded as driving the body very much as the man at the steering wheel drives a car. The inner man wills an action, the outer executes it. The inner loses his appetite, the outer stops eating. The inner man wants, and the other gets. The inner has the impulse, and the outer obeys. So the inner agent 
is the self. And think about when we've talked about self, when a bunch of different philosophers have talked about self. When we talk about this thing, we're often referring to this vague concept that isn't physical. It doesn't have physical dimensions, right? It's not like a thing with weight. It's not a thing that you could measure uh, in terms of how big it is. It doesn't have mass. And instead, we call it mental. Think of when we talked about Descartes, when we talked about Barclay. All of these people believe that there was this immaterial component to reality, right? Uh, this immaterial component it was not material. It was mental. It was mind. And this is where the self was situated. And an example of us believing in this is the idea that when we look at a body, a dead body, we say, oh, the person's gone. The person lives on, like their soul or their spirit or something. Um, but the vessel in which the spirit was situated is now gone. And he's kind of insulting this, right? Because he says uh, primitive peoples believed in this, but so do we. And so when we talk about a self or a mind or even a personality, which may be uh, weird because maybe some of us think a personality is like a legitimate thing for psychology to study, uh, we're making the same error, according to Skinner. Right? The person inside is driving the body. And I want to go back to this image that I pulled up earlier. If you look at this, even if you've never consciously thought about it, this is probably how you understand what's going on. You think, I am not a body, but that I have a body. Most of us think, you know, to use the metaphor, there's this person, just like in the picture, that's kind of in your head right driving the car and this is this is the real you this is consciousness this is that that essence to go back to that word and this is the ghost in the machine and so many depictions of this exist within like art and pop culture if any of you guys watch black mirror this is all the time something they talk about they always represent consciousness as this little person inside the person's head and what Skinner is telling us is this isn't real. It's true we all believe in it, right? We all think there's a thing called a self. And we all think that this self has the freedom to act. But it's not really the case. And think about why the self needs to exist in order for free will to exist. Like, a chair isn't free to do what a chair wants or to become anything other than a chair. Because... The chair is not conscious. The chair has no self. My computer isn't free to do whatever it wants because there is no self. So what you want to understand is that free will can only exist if there is a non-material self because it's that non-material self that would have the free will. And so Skinner's uh, method of argument would be to disprove the existence of the self and once he's able to disprove the existence of the self he is then uh, also disproved the existence of free will let's go on to see where else he goes with this he says it is not the layman alone who resorts to these practices for many reputable psychologists use a similar dualistic system of explanation the inner man is sometimes personified clearly as when delinquent behavior is attributed to a, quote, disordered personality, or he may be dealt with in fragments, as when behavior is attributed to mental processes, faculties, and traits. Since the inner man does not occupy space, he may be mul uh, multiplied at will, that's supposed to say. It has been argued that a single physical organism is controlled by several psychic agents and that the behavior is the result of their several wills. The Freudian concepts of the ego, superego, and the id are often used in this way. So it's not just us that makes this mistake. It's not just quote-unquote regular people that make this error. It's really influential psychologists. It's really 
relevant philosophers that people have been talking about for years that make this mistake. Experts make this mistake, right? And the mistake is believing in dualism. So you guys know what dualism is, right? We talked about it throughout the whole semester. Uh, dualism was this idea that reality was composed of two substances, the material slash physical stuff, and then the immaterial slash mental stuff. Um, that's wrong, according to Skinner. Right? He thinks there is no such thing as a mind apart from a brain. They're the same thing. And we're just lying to ourselves when we tell ourselves otherwise. And he obviously takes a dig at Freud here. Um, if any of you have studied psychoanalysis, there's this idea that you know these things called the ego, the superego, and the id all exist within one's mind in some sense, and they all have uh, different drives and purposes, and these things are in constant conflict. But that would be garbage for Skinner because it would utilize a kind of dualism. And so think back to all the philosophers we've read. I guess an interesting thing to ask yourself at this point is like, well, who is a, who is a dualist? Who believed in immaterial substance? Well, Plato seemed to, right? Because he believed in forms. And if we go historically, Descartes certainly was a dualist, right? He is the dualist. Locke seemed to believe in dualism too, right? Because he said it's consciousness, not matter that determines what a self is. Barclay, not a dualist, but he did strongly believe in an immaterial substance. Remember, he was an idealist, so he thought only um, sensations existed or, or ideas within a subject existed. And who came after that? Hume. We didn't talk much about Hume's substance position or Kant's. But that's like four people right off the bat that Skinner would disagree with, and, and that's many philosophers and many psychologists. But we want to ask a couple questions now, because if Skinner is right, this has a lot of ramifications. Here are two questions we want to ask. If there's no such thing as an immaterial self, then one, what is the real cause of human behavior? Because we used to think it was a self, but there is no self. And if there is no self, then what's, what's really making me who I am? I mean, there's not even an I. I guess that question presupposes too many things. What makes me do the things that I do, if not the self? And the second question is, then where does all this leave us with regard to a proper metaphysical foundation? So if dualism is wrong, and if idealism is wrong, and they're both wrong for the same reason, namely that they assert the existence of some kind of non-physical substance, then, then what's the correct metaphysical position? Skinner has some answers for this. So look at 31. Skinner says, um, The practice of looking inside the organism for an explanation of behavior has tended to obscure the variables which are immediately available for a scientific analysis. These variables lie outside the organism in its immediate environment and in its environmental history. They have a physical status to which the usual techniques of science are adapted, and they may make it possible to explain behavior as other subjects are explained in science. These independent variables are of many sorts, and their reactions to behavior are often subtle and complex, but we cannot hope to give an adequate account of behavior without analyzing them. So he's going the complete opposite route, right? Our tendency is to look inside of the thing when we're looking for causes. Skinner's saying, no, 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 there is no inside. And so we have to look outside the organism. We have to look at external factors. We have to look at the environmental factors, right? What's going on in the environment? How are those things happening in the world interacting with the physical systems of the subject? How is the history of that subject influencing what it does? And notice how when we shift to this type of explanation, um, we're shifting to a purely physical standpoint. There is only physical stuff. There is no such thing as mental stuff. And once we do this, 
it becomes possible to study the phenomena scientifically, right? Because st- remember, science by definition, the natural sciences by definition, um, is the study of physical nature. And that, that's the important point to take away from here. But let's look at the bottom of 31 going into 32. And I apologize. I think they're mowing the lawn outside or something. Um, Skinner says, consider the act of drinking a glass of water. This is not likely to be an important bit of behavior in anyone's life, but it supplies a convenient example. Suppose we now bring someone into a room and place a glass of water before him. Will he drink? There appear to be only two possibilities. Either he will or he will not. But we may speak of the chances that he will drink. And this notion may be refined for scientific use. What we want to evaluate is the probability that he will drink. And this may range from virtual certainty that drinking will um, over to a certainty that it will not. That should say drinking will occur. Uh, By arranging a history of severe deprivation, we could be, quote, absolutely sure that drinking water would occur. Uh, We may obtain an effect similar to that of deprivation by speeding up the excretion of water. For example, we may induce sweating by raising the temperature of the room or by forcing heavy exercise. On the other hand, we may set the probability of drinking water at virtually zero by inducing or forcing our subject to drink a large quantity of water before the experiment. So, okay, you have this question. Is someone going to drink water? You bring them into a room, you put a glass in front of them, are they going to drink or not? Well, obviously they either will or they won't. That's, that much is, is, is not interesting, but Skinner is saying what he's concerned with, what science is concerned with, is probability. They're evaluating the probability that this person will drink. And his point is that we could manipulate the environmental conditions of the situation such that we could ensure that a certain behavior is going to ensue. So for example, we put someone at the table with a glass of water. How can we make them drink? Well, we make it so that they're thirsty before the experiment takes place. So we increase the likelihood that the person's going to drink. Or similarly, we make the person drink a large quantity of water right before the experiment so that they're not thirsty and so that they don't drink from the water on the table. And this is Skinner's point. It's like the person at the table doesn't actually choose to drink in the way that we traditionally think of this word choose. It's not like, okay, there's a body sitting at the table and then inside the body is this ghost in my head this mind this self and this self is gonna decide whether or not i'm gonna move my arm and drink the water it's nothing of that sort i am merely just a collection of physical properties that have been directed or influenced to do certain things because of how they've interacted with external physical properties and that's it there's no choice there's no free will Everything's just a series of interactions between stuff. To continue, he says, um, the external variables of which behavior is a function provide for what may be called a causal or functional analysis. We undertake to predict and control the behavior of the individual organism. Uh, This is our dependent variable, the effect for which we are to find the cause. Our independent variables, that's the cause of behavior, are the external conditions of which behavior is a function. Sorry again for this mowing the lawn stuff. Uh, Relations between the two, the cause and effect relationships and behavior, are the laws of science. A synthesis of these laws are expressed in quantitative terms, and they yield a comprehensive picture of the organism as a behaving system. So that's what Skinner is interested in, a functional analysis. What that means is, In order to understand what something is, we have to understand what it does and the causes for what it does. And remember, those causes are physical. So we're looking at things functionally. And if we're looking at the function of something, we're looking at the agent, but again, not the inner agent, just an organism. 
and we're looking at the external conditions uh, that the organism finds itself in. And all of this stuff is capable of being explained within the laws of science, within quantitative terms. That's a key, right? Because quantitative things, uh, this means they're like objectively demonstrable. Uh, this means they are measurable. This means they're publicly accessible. Like we can all watch it happen. It's not private. Whereas think about this idea of the self and consciousness. Like that can't be quantified because it's private because only you can access it. No one else can. But we don't want that. We want things that we can all access, that we can confirm objectively. We want quantitative measurements. And so the bottom line is that at the end of the day, the organism, the subject, whatever you want to call it, it is nothing other than a behaving system. And that's it. So here's some questions that we went over before. We said, if there's no such thing as an immaterial self, then what is the real cause of human behavior? Well, for Skinner, it's external causes, not internal ones. And of course, what he means by that is environmental conditions and environmental factors. Um, this could be something as simple as you didn't drink, so now you're thirsty and you drink. Or it could be something more complex, like your parents beat you when you were younger and this affected your psychological development. Or it could be that... You're, um, you were rewarded for certain things and punished for certain things, and that's why you behave the way you do. And that's actually what Skinner is most concerned with, something called operant conditioning. And there'll be a video to that, and I'll put the link below. Uh, and the second question was, well, then where does this leave us with regard to a metaphysical position? Easy. Physicalism. So you have dualism, you have idealism, and you have physicalism. And physicalism says that reality is composed of just one substance, physical stuff. So matter, energy, the properties of these things. So if you were to kind of break it down categorically, you would say there are certain metaphysical positions which are monistic, right? Monism, monism. And this means that reality is made of one substance. So, for example, physicalism is a monistic position, but so is idealism. Sure, they disagree with respect to what that substance is, but they both agree that there's just one substance. And then you have dualism, which of, uh, of course uh, asserts two substances. Then there's other things called like pluralism, uh, and then there's property dualism, blah, 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 blah. But we haven't gotten to any of that stuff. So at the end of the day, just know um, the subject is not some inner conscious self thing. It's just, it's just behavior. That's all it is. So here's some videos that I think you guys will find helpful. And I put the links to these things in Canvas and I'll also put them in the description of the video on YouTube. So the first is a video where Skinner is describing this thing called operant conditioning. You may have heard of classical conditioning. This is the thing where um, the dogs were trained to salivate at the sound of a bell. Operant conditioning is similar, but it's much more complex. And this video involves some interesting experiments uh, Skinner did with pigeons that he thinks explains human behavior, such as gambling, but they can really apply to anything. So check that out. Um, and he also talks about free will in that video. And this is something cool that, that doesn't have to do with Skinner directly, but is related to this free will debate. Uh, it's called the Libet experiment. Now, in the Libet experiment, um, the researcher hooked someone up to, I think it was like an fMRI machine or something like that, and told them to pick something and told them to push a button when they consciously decided that they picked the thing. And what the research showed is that the scientist was able to detect brain functions before the person made, quote unquote, made the choice. In other words, scientists can tell when you've made a choice before you've made a choice. And if they could do that, mm, I don't know, like maybe puts uh, some nails in the casket of, of free will. But at the end of the day, all this points to this position. Here's a word you're gonna wanna know. It was one of the key terms in the guided reading questions that I gave you guys on the syllabus, determinism. Skinner is a behaviorist and behaviorism is a form of determinism. 
And determinism is simply the position in philosophy that there is no such thing as free will and that everything is just determined by physical causes. And last but not least, I know I keep plugging the podcast, but that's not intentional. It just, well, I guess it is, but it just happens to be because we've done episodes on stuff we're talking about now in class. So um, episodes 10 and 11, me and Professor Rotolo specifically talked about free will um, and mentioned Skinner and a lot of the stuff that we're thinking about. So if you guys want to check that out, I think that'll be helpful. And that's basically it. I'll see you around.